Welcome, everybody. We at the Italian Academy for Advanced Studies and its International Observatory for Cultural Heritage are proud to have with us today five distinguished scholars to speak to us and discuss Native American perspectives on environment, climate, and cultural, change, uh, cultural heritage. But let's begin by reflecting on the fact that the very land on which we stand here, at least the very land on which we here in New York at the Italian Academy for Advanced Studies, that the very land on which we stand here in Manhattan is the ancestral home of the Lenape peoples, long predating the establishment of the European colonies here. Now, such an acknowledgement has rightly become an essential way of beginning all meetings at Columbia University, the ironically named Columbia University, and every place first inhabited by the indigenous peoples of the United States and wrenched from them over now countless years, pretty much unceasingly and unconscionably. But this declaration does not absolve us from the responsibility of learning from the indigenous peoples and cultures of this continent. There is another reason why this form of introduction is important and critical. It's simply because no other group of peoples have for so long and so consistently been attentive to the very environmental and climate issues that are the subject of our meeting today and lie at the very heart of the most pressing issues and crises of our time. Perhaps if we had hearkened to the lessons of the peoples represented by our speakers and the other indigenous peoples of America, we might have been much further along the road to containing the threats that so clearly loom before us. But there's yet more. Who have more clearly perceived and more clearly exemplified the crucial relationship between climate, environment, and culture than the Native American cultures in our very midst, in our very midst, those very cultures that we are still striving to give space to alongside the need to provide resources for a reflourishing of the economic bases on which these cultures rest. We cannot ourselves lie easy until the fundamental bases of our national economy have been revised to allow for the health and welfare of all the peoples in the United States and not just for the privileged elites. So we here are proud that already in 2018, we here at the uh, International Observatory for Cultural Heritage at the a Italian Academy are proud that uh, already in 2018, our conference on threatened heritage um, was able to provide a platform to those whose territories had most recently been usurped by the avaricious and grossly insensitive policies of the Trump administration. And in that 2019, we had yet another group of Native American scholars bringing to the fore the question of the relationship between indigenous communities and the inevitably hegemonic inclinations of museums and private and public collections of our time. Today, so it's, an, I've, it's not for me to speak about such issues. I'm really happy to say that we have with us Angelo Baca, who was the inspiring force between our, uh, behind our conference on Bears Ears, Chaco, and Threatened Heritage. So uh, Angelo will do the further introductions of our distinguished colleagues from all over the country, from a group of different tribes and different peoples. Angelo will introduce each of them one by one. But I just want to say, seeing that no one is here to introduce him except me, I just want to remind you that he's the cultural resources coordinator at the Utah Dina Bekaya, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the defense and protection of culturally and um, uh, environmentally significant ancestral lands. The National Parks Associ Conservation Association, in fact, recently designated him as one of the 10 under 40 dynamic cultural, most dynamic cultural activists who make up the association's next generation advisory council. Um, so I'm going to leave it to you, Angelo. I realize that I um, 
must also thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for helping sponsor this conference. So thank you all for being here. I want to thank all those of you who are looking to testify to your interest in this urgent topic before us today. We we'll only stand to learn from you. Now let me hand you over to Angelo. Angelo, and welcome to you all. Well, th thank you much. I really appreciate that, uh, uh, David. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Italian Academy's interest in, in talking about cl climate in such a uh, welcome and inclusive way, um, as we having to do with many of indigenous work and the history and culture that informs their approaches to these work. So um, I'm very glad uh, to be a part of this and uh, just want to introduce myself. Um, so uh, Angelo Bakashia, Plashti Inishle, Kishashishin, Chitni Dashiche, Nakai Dishanella. My name is Angelo Baka. I'm Navajo. I'm from the Bears Ears area. I am a um, uh, PhD student at NYU and am currently the cultural resources here for Utah Deneb So I am really just uh, doing a moderation and facilitation for people who will be presenting some marvelous material. And first, first I'd like to uh, um, introduce uh, our first um, uh, who is going to be uh, uh, Professor Darren Ranko from the University of Maine. Uh, and just to let folks know that it's uh, Sarah Krakoff that has to cancel today. Um, although I do believe that Elizabeth Cronk Warner will not be able to join us the entire time for the round table. So um, as you know, the pandemic is kind of interesting, keeps us on our turn. Things are never quite as they should be, but Bills to have everybody here and, um, you know, doing uh, some good work that they're going to be sharing with us here today. So to introduce Darren Ranko, uh, he's got a joint appointment at the University of Maine in the Department of Anthropology, uh, the Senator George, G., George J. Mitchell Center for Sustainability S Solutions and in Native American Programs, where he serves as Chair of Native American Programs and Coordinator of Native American Research. His Research focuses on the ways in which communities in the United States resist environmental destruction by using indigenous diplomacies and critiques of liberalism to protect cultural resources. State knowledge systems in real contexts continue to expose indigenous peoples to an inordinate amount of environmental risk. He teaches classes on indigenous intellectual property rights, research ethics, environmental justice, and governance. A member of the Penobscot Nation, he is particularly interested in better research relationships can be made between universe, native and non-native researchers, and indigenous communities. So join me in welcoming uh, Professor Ranko, and um, I think we turn the time over to you. Did you Thank you very much. Gwegwe Danagakiyo, Natalwisi, Darren Ranko. Hello, good evening. I'm Darren Ranko. I'm a Penobscot Nation citizen in my own homeland here uh, of the Wabanaki Confederacy, which is, and I'll talk more about this later, in, in what uh, we call Maine or the Maritime Provinces of Canada, on a place I call Turkey Hill. Uh, and the turkeys have been pretty active the last couple of days, so they, they also send their greetings. Uh, and I want to thank um, and congratulate the Italian Academy and Columbia University for assembling a really fine panel of indigenous scholars. It's a it's an amazing group of, of, of folks. And uh, yeah, I'm so excited for this evening. So maybe I'm going to have sh a slide shared. Someone's going to put those up, I think. Help me out. I have to, this is like the degree of difficulty in centering my my image is like that's the the biggest thing i do want to say and, and this is work that ongoing work um and this the a lot of the data that i'm going to present tonight was was um collected um in partnership with uh wabanaki tribal nations but also by my graduate student natalie michelle who 
is also an indigenous scholar, uh, Passamaquoddy and, and Penobscot. So that's uh, it's a really exciting uh, bit of work. So I want to give you, and uh, because of limited time, I can't give you the full context of this work. I will say that part of it in terms of the data collection begins with a, um, a grant by the Passamaquoddy tribe of Pleasant Point Zubayak starting in 2015, which was about um, looking at uh, the steps for climate adaptation, um, as this name, steps in adapting Wabanaki culture and economy to a changing climate. But it really is the first uh, attempt by our tribes up here to engage this work. Um, I will talk about uh, Wabanaki diplomacy as both place of this work and the process by which we mobilize this uh, work as well. Um, I want to ask the question, can climate adaptation work reflect indigenous community perspectives? I actually think there's uh, one or two of the other presentations will also do this. Um, I will present um, some initial findings of our climate adaptation planning and then really ruminate on this idea from adaptation to action in a context that is distinctly Wabanaki. So and I actually saw just the, the, the beginnings of a couple of the other presentation slides. Um, and I think we're all engaged with this literature around resilience and climate justice. Um, for, for a lot of us doing this work, resilience and adaptation must go together um, and that uh, they must be uh, part of community and social community, social and cultural resi uh, resilience, the sort of the assets uh, that we have as indigenous peoples through our um, cultures, communities and um, responsibilities we have to um, our homelands. So um, just you could see many ways to define resilience. This is a very classical uh, definition from Mastandrea um, that, that requires, in order to attain resilience in these kinds of rapid environmental changes, requires both top down and bottom up frames and should have communities control the knowledge inputs and outputs. This is very critical to this, this process. Um, and then following other scholars, of course, that the identification the identification of community assets is key to uh, climate uh, resilience. Uh, there are many critiques around some of this, some of these words, and I hope we get into that. So, bringing us to um, Wabanaki, the the name we use for our uh, tribes up here means in in the uh, people of the Don or in the Don land. Um, for let's see, come on, clicker. Uh, so just as a little bit of background, this grant that that, be, that started this work um, was very much uh, one tribe, the Passamaquoddy tribe, Pleasant Point, Sabayak, uh, taking the lead um, in, in on behalf of the other um, tribes here uh, and to really say, what can we do together? How do we uh, orchestrate this work that is based, so community-based, salient, culturally relevant? climate adaptation plans, how do we begin this work across our region, across our tribes, and to really think about um, these coming climate uh, impacts uh, and how we will adapt in ways that uh, really offers our continued um, resilience and, 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 and thriving uh, on our landscape. Um, they, they are taking the lead for this work partly because of in 2012 there was a uh, FEMA for the very first time started to include climate in their um, uh, sort of mitigation plans, hazard mitigation plans for the tribes uh, in, in this region. And they uh, identified the Passamaquoddy tribe, Pleasant Point, which is the only um, reservation, their reservation is the only one sort of near the, uh, along the coast of Maine, uh, the ocean coast of Maine. And um, they saw a significant sea level rise impact on the infrastructure. And since that time, since 2012, they've really taken the lead and, and offer great leadership for the other tribes in, in, uh, in the region around trying to develop uh, climate adaptation work. So for our methods in this work, we, we do a lot of multi-method approach, um, influenced of course by 
uh, indigenous research methods, community-based participatory research. We also have a sustainability science in terms of public engagements around our research. And again, really understanding the key to adaptation is based in community, social, and cultural resilience. The cultural frames of this work, which are really important to understanding um, both how we understand the quote unquote problem and how we have gone about trying to address this problem, um, in both involve Wabanaki diplomacy. And, and I'll say more about that. So this, I didn't put this up front, but this is the location of the, 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 the sort of seats of government of each of the tribes in Maine, uh, the my re reservation, the Penobscot Nation Indian Island Reservation, the two Passamaquoddy reservations in Washington County in, in down east Maine, and then the two northern reservations, the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians and Rusa Band of Micmacs. But that's just one way of kind of thinking about it, you know, so we have on the right, again, the locations of our sort of seats of government, but on the left, side of the screen you see actually the tribal land holdings across the state where in both the Penobscot uh, nation and the Passamaquoddy tribe had significant land holdings through central and western Maine um, some of our reservation lands some are fee lands uh, I, I'd say actually the majority of reservation lands some are fee lands um, but our land holdings in terms of what we were looking what we're looking at in this work it involves all our land holdings um, uh, um, and how they're how they're impacted and how we will adapt um and then something that that got immobilized in a very important way through our work is that um as wabanaki people as we engage addressing large-scale impacts to our lands and resources um it's a very natural thing to think about um our territory in the broadest possible way uh, our diplomatic traditions are rooted in our confederacy uh, and our wampum belt uh, knowledge and traditions and sort of how we engage across our landscape, the Wabanaki landscape, in terms of responding to um, large uh, threats, which we did with uh, the invasion of, of the uh, European uh, and Euro-American colonizers. So that's the place part of Wabanaki diplomacy that we mobilize in response to these large uh, sort of threats to our territories that's hundreds if not thousands of years old as a process um, again these are um, processes rooted in our wampum belt traditions that defined how we come together as multicultural multinational uh, entities um, there's evidence that these were more formalized during the invasion uh, of Euro uh, European powers and Euro, Euro American colonial structures, but um, there's also great evidence that these predate um, by significant periods of time uh, the European uh, contact. So the scholarship on our Confederacy goes back uh, uh, 40, 50, 60, even back to spec uh, about 100 years ago. Um, and it's been studied and understood by scholars as this sort of adaptation to external pressures uh, existed in our minds uh, and, and part of persuasive discourse. But more importantly, in terms of how we continue to mobilize um, this to solve large scale problems that impact uh, all of us um, is rooted in uh, protocols. Um, I don't have time to go into that many of the protocols, but a core one is this, and, and this is in Passamaquoddy, see Dogwen, Dole Westu. Um, everyone talks, uh, there's a, a seat at the table and an influence on process by everyone engaging in this work. And um, we've tried to um, honor that in really uh, significant ways in our research. So in terms of shifting to our findings and um, the threats to our uh, lands, peoples, and relations in, in our territory uh, should sound familiar to people living in the Northeast um, and probably in lots of other places around the world. Well, of course, we're going to have increase in degree days. Um, one a significant thing that has to do with it's really impacting our moose population is the increase in winter, winter ticks. Ticks are no longer being 
killed off during colder parts of the winter because they don't exist anymore. And then we've been doing work on invasive species, including the emerald ash borer, and then um, this longer term issue around erosion from increased precipitation and other kinds of feedbacks related to erosion and precipitation. Um, obviously, the increase uh, in, in uh, temperature is actually being felt and recognized more so in water temperature. This is true across the globe, of course. And this is uh, already leading to impacts on fish and forest practices. Um, I already mentioned the invasive species. There's the fact that the northern main uh, climate transition zone will, will change significantly in terms of its plant, insect, bird, tree kinds of populations. And the impact on our cultural values um, is uh, uh, already being felt, but also uh, will be significant around our subsistence, economic, health, and recreation uh, parts of our community. So in reflecting, and we, we did a series of um, focus groups and interviews, and we had um, a, a major meeting in the fall of 2017, and we continue to work on uh, adaptation priorities with, the, with all the tribes. Um, the priorities, and this rings true for a lot of, there's a lot of tribes out there. We, great, we, we, we gained great inspiration from especially the, the folks in the Pacific North, Northwest um, who've been doing this work. Um, we had the Swinomish out uh, to talk to us during uh, a couple of our meetings. Um, these are common themes around how we're prioritizing, you know, what our adaptation priorities are given these um, impacts. Uh, fighting against the loss of native language and our stories because this is our, our, these are the assets that we bring uh, and that will be critical to our adaptation. Um, a second one has to do with our fight for food sovereignty and connections to food. Um, um, we've already been dealing with a uh, disconnect from our sea mammals, but also this threat against the moose. And then more broadly, just our resilience in terms of our food systems, um, especially in uh, rural, the more rural parts of Maine. Um, and then finally, the sort of other top priority is this work to protect cultural sites threatened by sea level rise and erosion. Um, and this is very familiar to other coastal tribal nations doing this work. Sort of, there are a bunch of other kinds of cultural resource and uh, uh, other pieces to it, but I'd say these, this issue around language, story, food sovereignty, cultural sites, these form the priorities in terms of our immediate actions. One of the other things, and this is um, um, one of the major identified um, things that came out of our fall 27 meeting was that a real commitment to writing, and we're, we've been working on this since then, writing a Wabanaki Confederacy climate adaptation plan. And this stretches across the um, so-called international uh, border that separates our tribes from one another. Um, and really focusing on our commonalities and our food security, food sovereignty issues. And this has actually led me and the university to high, really prioritize food sovereignty work at the University of Maine. And we actually have a position open. So if anyone's listening out there um, on indigenous food sovereignty, um, uh, love to see the applicants come in. Um, and then really, for us, because we're defying that the zone of action across an international boundary, we're really trying to work to leverage the Confederacy to help one another, um, both uh, indigenous and non-indigenous people across the wider region. Um, again, part of our language and story work uh, has to do with governance and really emphasizing clan mothers and how families um, are there to strengthen our identities. And then also, um, mobilizing the language from the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, as the um, core set of values, core set of uh, engagements with the settler states and the international community. Um, of course, are the adaptation needs, uh, ongoing work that is in process, uh, education on climate related topics for our tribal leadership and for tribal citizens. Um, one thing that they've been really uh, drilling down in, and we, we have a program called the Wabanaki Youth and Science Program at the University of Maine, where we're doing more hands-on projects that involve uh, tribal youth uh, to really uh, engage with community climate projects. Um, 
that's ongoing. We're trying to do a number of, um, uh, of things related to water has been really important. Um, and then we also, uh, was brought up again and again, our, our tribal governments, much like um, the state federal governments are often um, siloed uh, in the way that this work needs to happen. And so this idea of integrated community planning related to it, a climate has been really um, starting to be pursued by our tribal governments. And this is about bringing together transportation, social services, health, emergency response, wildlife, et cetera. So um, I was able to keep it uh, a little under 20 minutes here it's it's uh in conclusion i i will say that you know this work is ongoing we um are engaged in, in further work sessions sponsored by the northeast climate uh, science center and starting in january here at the university of maine native american programs we will be the um, um, lead partner uh around uh, tribal um uh, partnerships for the for any CASC, the, the Northeastern uh, Climate Adaptation Science Center, um, and that's just a recognition that we have developed some protocols around this work, um, but really centering uh, Indigenous research frames and and research needs. Uh, for us, the obviously the uh, climate adaptation planning uh, must link to Indigenous places and processes such as we saw as Wabanaki diplomacy as both place and process. Um, and we uh, are working on being inspired by the, um, the climate adaptation menu work that um, um, the uh, Great Lakes Inter Intertribal Fish Commission did, um, working on a Wabanaki-based uh, climate adaptation menu, which uh, will identify key elements of Wabanaki traditional um, resource uh, management to help us uh, help guide us through climate adaptation, uh, the needs around climate adaptation. And then finally, and this is you know one of the things that came out of our fall 2017 meeting um, was that uh, there's a lot of uh, justice elements around this work and you know we've seen the conversations in cop uh 26 uh, just finished in scotland um you know who has to change who has to adapt uh and how and why um our uh the attitude we came out with was that we must be the leaders in our region as indigenous people and um, we uh, obviously need the recognition in terms of our sovereignty and resources to provide this leadership, which is happening worldwide. And I think uh, that will be touched on in some of the other talks. So thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to further discussion later on. Great, thank you, uh, Professor Darren Renko. I believe that uh, your work is really reflective of the times and uh, the challenges ahead of us, and especially in terms of Native communities and uh, the climate. So I really appreciate that presentation. We'll move now towards uh, Professor Elizabeth Cronk Warner, who is Dean and Professor of Law at the S.J. Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. She was formerly Associate Dean and Professor of Law at the University of Kansas Law School where she was also the director of the Tribal Law and Government Center. Uh, she's nationally recognized expert in the intersection of environmental and law. She has taught courses in property, Indian environmental and natural resources law and supervised the KU Tribal Judicial Support Clinic. She has received several teaching awards, co-authored uh, several books on environmental issues in Native Americans, and has over 40 articles and book chapters to her credit. Dean Cronk Warner, a citizen of the Salt St. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, served as an appellate judge for the tribe and as a district judge for the Prairie Band Potawatomi tribe. Um, Professor Warner previously was an active member of the Federal Bar Association, serving on its national board. Um, and he's, uh, is, serving on its National Board of Directors. In 2014, she received the Federal Bar Association President's Award for Leadership in Extraordinary Service, Commitment, and Guidance to the Federal Bar Association, 
and its members. Uh, she's currently active in the American Bar Association, where she is co-chair uh, of the Native American Resources Committee. She holds a JD uh, from the University of Michigan, uh, BS from Cornell University, and studied at Nanyang Technological University uh, in Singapore. Uh, so just wanted to also flag here for us that she is, um, uh, she is doing amazing work uh, here in Utah, uh, which is where I'm at with the San Juan County, Utah and uh, just recognizing that it's really hard to do Native-centered work in a state that really um, pushes back against Native communities uh, in terms of law and sovereignty. So applaud her already uh, for that work. So I want to turn the t uh, time over to you, um, Elizabeth Cronk Warner. Thank you. Boshu Anishinaabe, hello friends, and uh, thank you, Che Miigwech, Angelo, for that beautiful and very um, uh, generous introduction. I, I agree that we have our challenges in Utah, but glad to have two of us on this presentation and an opportunity to talk about these issues. So my pronouns are she and hers, and as I like to do, because I'm coming to you from the Salt Lake Valley, which is traditional indigenous lands, I would like to start off by acknowledging that we here at the University of Utah acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. So it seems really appropriate that we should be here today for this important community outreach and discussion. So with that, if I could have my PowerPoint, please. And it's really appropriate uh, that I should speak after our first speaker because my presentation and comments really uh, pick up uh, where he left off. So he did a wonderful job of kind of explaining resiliency and how different tribal communities can identify resources that are important to that community that are necessary to protect through climate change. And that's where the lawyers can pick up. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what some tribes have done in terms of the climate change context and specifically climate change adaptation. And ultimately my thesis is that uh, there's a lot to learn from tribes in terms of both climate change adaptation and in terms of environmental justice, which I will talk about as well. So moving on then, before I jump into the discussion of environmental justice and climate change adaptation from a legal perspective, I do want to give an introduction to a couple of principles that I'll be talking about. Again, this presentation really comes from the legal perspective or the legal lens. So the first is tribal sovereignty, and, and you definitely heard about that in our first presentation for today. And it's important to note and to respect that tribal sovereignty persists today. So we pre-existed the formation of the United States. So tribes have authority and sovereignty that is separate and apart from the federal government. And that's an important um, issue, especially when we're looking at these issues of environmental justice or climate change adaptation, because sometimes there's confusion that tribes are somehow um, have delegations of authority from the federal government or receive their authority from the federal government. But that is not the case. We are separate gov uh, governments that pre-existed. Um, in fact, if you look at the Constitution, we are only referenced in a couple of places, um, such as the Indian Commerce Clause with Congress and the ability of the president to make treaties with uh, tribes. And that's because the founding fathers did not view tribes as being under the jurisdiction of the United States of America. And that persists to this day. There have been some changes to the rule. Um, so we don't necessarily have territorial jurisdiction, for example. Um, but the Supreme Court has affirmed uh, every time that it has looked at it, all the way up through the 1978 decision um, involving Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martinez, that tribes do have inherent jurisdiction over their members on their territory. So when we're talking about these issues of environmental justice and climate change, we are oftentimes talking about issues that really strike at the core of tribal sovereignty because you're talking about issues that directly impact the health and stability of our tribal populations, as we heard in the 
the first pre uh, presentation, and also certainly the existence of our tribal borders as climate change threatens the mere existence of many of our tribal and indigenous communities within the United States. Second, just want to take some, a moment to explain the relationship between the federal um, government and tribal uh, nations and then also the federal trust relationship. So even though tribal sovereignty persists today, there is this tension with our relationship with the federal government because the federal government does two things. First, the federal government has plenary authority, meaning that if the federal government wanted to, it could assert its authority over Indian country. Secondly, um, the federal government also in exchange for the succession of land. So this is more of a contract. There's oftentimes a stereotype that tribes are somehow unfairly um, in bad faith beholden to the federal government, but that couldn't be further from the truth. The reality is that is a contractual relationship whereby the federal government agreed to take on a relationship in exchange for land succession. And so that relationship still exists today. And so the federal government has a moral obligation to always act in the best interest of Indian country. And I use that term to refer to our indigenous communities within the United States. That's an interesting little side point. We have um, both tribes that are federally recognized in the United States. We have over 500 federally recognized tribes. Those are tribes where the federal government has said we do have a government to government relationship between the federal government and those tribes. But we also have tribes that are state recognized. So states may recognize them, but the federal government may not. And then of course we have um, indigenous communities within the United States that have no recognition either from the state or from the federal government. An excellent example of that are the native Hawaiians uh, who even though I don't think anybody would argue that they're indigenous and have strong claims to their territory um, for a wide variety of political and historical reasons uh, have not gotten recognition to date. But with these federally recognized tribes, there is this federal trust relationship that at its base is a moral responsibility to act in its best interest. But in some instances, there's actually a legal obligation for the federal government to act in the best interest of tribes. And so there have been numerous instances throughout history where tribes have successfully sued the federal government saying, look, these are one of these instances when you owe us this federal trust responsibility, and so you have this obligation. I also want to briefly explain that there, when I use the term Indian law, I'm using that term broadly to encompass both tribal law and federal Indian law. So what's the difference between the two different types of law? So tribal law is the law of the tribe, and every tribe has different laws, and that's inherent in the fact that every tribe is sovereign. And so when you go to a different tribe, you're likely to encounter different laws. Federal Indian law, however, is the law of the relationship between the federal government and tribes. So that is uniform across the United States in that how we govern that relationship between tribes and the federal government um, very much plays into that uniform relationship. Most of my presentation um, when I talk about climate change adaptation planning is actually going to tribal law because it's the authority of tribes to determine for themselves through their own inherent sovereignty how best to adapt to climate change adaptation. A good, again, a nice kind of corollary to our first presentation. And last but certainly not least, I do want to mention tribal treaties. Um, tribal treaties are still very much the law of this land, uh, very much upheld. Uh, tribes have a very strong record of success on tribal treaty claims uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court is probably the only legal argument that we have a strong legal uh, record of success in the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, but the Supreme Court has consistently, even within the last several years, said that where tribal treaties are still in effect and that they are clear that they will be enforced. So oftentimes to the backdrop of all of this work, so when we're talking about climate change adaptation or when we're talking about environmental justice concerns, there's also these elements of what do the tribal treaties say in that specific instance. And we'll see that as we go through some of these um, examples today. So next, we have uh, environmental justice. So let's start to delve a little bit into each of these two topics. Again, we're talking about environmental justice, 
and climate change from a legal perspective, building on the pr previous presentation. Um, so first, environmental justice. So when I use the term environmental justice, I'm referring to lower socioeconomic or communities of color that are disproportionately burdened by environmental pollution. And we know that this is a fact going back to the 1985 study, which demonstrated that in North Carolina, black counties or, or counties that were overwhelmingly black majority populations were being disproportionately targeted um, for dumps and for waste facilities. And we've only shown, we've only found further proof of that since that time that minority communities are repeatedly um, targeted for these types of endeavors. Why is that? because of course such communities don't have the wealth and the capacity to be able to effectively fight against um, these types of things. And so as a result, these communities in general are uniquely vulnerable under environmental justice. But specific to Indian country, Indian communities are environmental justice communities as well. I think sometimes we think about environmental justice in the urban context. And I encourage you to think about it in the rural context as well. And what you have here on the slide on the left-hand side is a diagram really demonstrating, and again, I think our first presentation talked about this a lot too, about how uh, just some examples of how Native communities can be um, particularly vulnerable to the impacts um, of environmental pollution and therefore be vulnerable environmental justice communities. So in our picture, we have a situation where a stream is being contaminated um, and you have uh, groundwater contamination and you have contamination that comes up through both the fisheries and through terrestrial animals. Um, and I thought it was interesting that our first speaker spoke about the importance of moose and spoke about the importance of marine mammals um, as really demonstrating this point. And so a lot of our indigenous communities will have increased um, access to pollution because of a subsistence lifestyle that relies so closely on the environment. And so this is one of the ways that many, um, not all, I don't want to stereotype, but many indigenous communities within the United States do find themselves to be environmental justice communities. There are other things um, that also have a tendency um, to put uh, native communities in perhaps more of a vulnerable situation. Um, so this could be things like a unique tie to the land. So for example, when I want to participate in my tribe's summer ceremonies, I can't do that here in Salt Lake City. As was mentioned, I'm a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, which is located in Michigan. And so for in order for me to participate, I need to actually go back to the land. I can't participate in a building, right? A church or a mosque or a synagogue. It's actually connected to the land. Um, also, many of our legal rights are connected to the land. And so these are ways that our connection to our land sometimes makes us a bit more vulnerable. The right side of this slide has additional thoughts on that. So additionally, there's a history of colonization um, within the United States that's not only the disposition of land, um, the literal and physical death of our peoples, and for example, that's coming to light and making the news yet again as the horrific history of boarding schools is making the news as bodies are literally being uncovered. We can see how generation upon generation of indigenous peoples within the United States have been victimized and colonized. Every native person that I know is one, two, or three generations away from somebody who was put in a boarding school and torn from their communities. When I lived in Montana, there were individuals in the community who, whose grandparents were present when they were removed from their reservations. So these historical traumas are not necessarily historical in our communities. They're still very much alive. And when we think about environmental justice, we have to take that into consideration. We also have to take into consideration the connection that many indigenous communities have to um, the world and to earth as a mother, both in terms of spiritual spirituality, but also in terms of life. And then you also have to take into consideration this backdrop of tribal sovereignty, treaty rights, and the government to government relationship that we talked about before. So how does this all come together? I think a really nice example that puts this into context is the Dakota Access Pipeline case. 
Um, so hopefully you all remember this situation really came to a head in 2016, um, leading into the election of President Trump and then going through the, the beginning first year of President Trump's term. You may recall that several uh, thousands upon thousands of indigenous individuals and their supporters camped um, at the mouth of the lake in order to stop the completion of the Dakota Ice access pipeline. The water protectors believe that it was not a question of if, it was a question of when, and were very concerned that any leakage um, of the pipeline would negatively impact their territories. And you really had to put this in historical context. It's not just about the pipeline. So this particular um, community had their treaty, the Great Sioux Nation um, treaty was abrogated when gold was found in the Black Hills. After the Sioux surrendered, or refused to surrender, excuse, excuse me, and give up their lands, the U.S. tried to starve them by overhunting buffalo and denying treaty rate rations. In 1890, after the U.S. outlawed Indian relations, uh, religions, the 7th Calvary um, shot and killed approximately 200 Sioux people while they prayed in a ceremony called the Ghost Dance. It was one of the largest mass shootings in the United States' history, even, to, to, even today. Um, 50 years ago, the federal government seized individual homes on the Standing Rock Reservation to build the Oaxaca Electric Dam. And today, many citizens of the Great Sioux Nation live on some of the poorest Indian reservations in the poorest counties in the United States. So we have to put these things into their perspective. And so the, the legal controversy was around whether or not to allow a permit that had to be approved by the federal government to go into place, which would have resulted in the pipeline being completed. And the reason why I raised this in environmental justice context is because the pipeline at issue was actually originally cited to go just north of Bismarck. And as you may know, Bismarck, North Dakota is an overwhelmingly non-diverse community. And instead of citing that pipeline at Bismarck, instead the pipeline was cited just 0.5 mile outside of the reservation. Now, isn't that interesting? just outside of the reservation so that the pipeline could negatively impact the reservation, close enough to negatively impact, but not within the reservation so that the tribe wouldn't have those legal arguments available to it had it been within the reservation. Now, initially the tribe protested and, and others protested the pipeline under the National Historic Preservation Act, arguing that the pipeline would desecrate uh, historic places of significance. And this is true, it did. There's a, a very sad, sad chapter of this story where um, there were numerous burial sites and sacred sites along the pipeline. And the parties were making a claim that the pipeline should be halted for that reason. And over the Labor Day weekend, and that's important because it was a long weekend, the um, Dakota Access Company bulldozed made many of those sites so that they would no longer be able to make that claim. But ultimately, um, the courts denied a preliminary injunction based on the National Historic Preservation Act, finding that there wasn't um, the immediacy of harm that they were claiming. But now this is interesting. So in the meantime, you have the Obama administration coming out or leaving in 2016. The Department of Justice, Department of Interior, and the Department of, of Army had all asked uh, for a stay on completion of the pipeline while they considered these issues. But President Trump came in, um, and as you may recall, the Tuesday after he was inaugurated, issued a presidential memorandum call, calling for expedited review of this pipeline. And then after that point, the National Historic Preservation Act pr uh, primary injunction was denied. But the tribes were ultimately successful on claims around the National Environmental Policy Act and specifically environmental justice and tribal treaty rights, which comes back to our earlier discussion. Because what the court found is that in doing the NEPA or the National Environmental Policy Act review, that the Army Corps, who was responsible for issuing the permit, had failed to consider the impacts of the pipeline and potential leakage of the pipeline on the tribe's treaty rights and also on environmental justice concerns. So ultimately, we saw that the tribe did have some success under the National Environmental Policy Act with regard to environmental justice and tribal treaty rights. Now, since that time, when that decision uh, happened positively for the tribe, oil had already started to flow through the pipeline. So now the parties are working through what does that mean 
when you already have um, a pipeline in production. So it's not possible for it to be enjoined. So that is ongoing. But I also want to talk and build on our first presentation and talk a little bit about climate change in Indian country. And I really like to point out climate change and the impacts of climate change are very much localized. That what you may be seeing in New York City could be very different from what we are seeing um, in Utah, although there's probably some corollaries along increased temperatures and drought. But there's going to be differences. And as a result, having that localized knowledge and that deep traditional ecological knowledge is incredibly beneficial, not only to indigenous communities, but also to state and local municipalities as well. We talk about this idea of the federal system of government as a laboratory of experimentation. The idea being that different states experiment with different ideas. And I posit to you that this is a space where tribes can be the leaders and should be the leaders because of that deep ecological knowledge. As I mentioned before, we do have some unique vulnerability to climate change because of our legal connections to land, our tribal treaties, um, our rights that are connected to land, and also because of our cultural and spiritual and historical ties. So again, going back to my example, um, I could not participate in my tribe's summer ceremonies here in Salt Lake City. It's necessary for me to go to my tribe in Michigan. Now, the federal law does not address climate change holistically. So we do not have federal climate adaptation planning. We do have some federal laws specific to uh, mobile source emissions, so vehicle emissions. Um, we have the clean power rule. But when it comes to climate change adaptation, there is not a holistic federal law. And so that means that this is a space, because tribes are separate sovereigns, through which tribes can and have been um, innovating in terms of developing new legal instruments. And we can really learn from these examples. And one example in particular I want to raise to you, although our first speaker mentioned um, some other tribes that have been doing really innovative work. So I also encourage you to look at the Jamestown Squalum tribe in Washington um, and the Nez Perce in Idaho um, and the Swinomish also in Washington as excellent examples of tribes that have really been leading in this space. But I do want to spend some time in my last few minutes talking about the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes of, uh, of, of Montana, excuse me. Um, so they are located on the Flathead Reservation. It's the combination of the Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderay uh, communities. And they came together to work on their climate adaptation plan. And they did a couple of things that I think are really exciting and really show how tribes have the capacity to lead in this space. Um, so after identifying all the impacts of climate change and doing that great work that our first speaker spoke to us about, they then did something that I really appreciated as a lawyer in that they interviewed their tribal elders to talk about and to record the traditional ecological knowledge of their community. So they first did the important scientific work to say, these are the impact of climate change on our community. And then they took the second step and said, this is the traditional ecological knowledge that our community already possesses to protect these resources. And so they married the two. They took kind of the Western scientific knowledge and married that with the traditional ecological knowledge. And so as a result, the climate change adaptation plan of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes incorporates explicitly traditional ecological knowledge into that legal document. Additionally, as was mentioned, it's really important to have collaboration. And so the tribe talks extensively in its strategic plan and adaptation planning about the importance to coordinate with its local community and also Montana um, specifically as a state. We can see that there are emerging trends within um, tribal climate change adaptation. Over 80 tribes have now engaged in climate change adaptation. Again, this is another reason because of the depth of knowledge here that tribes can really serve as leaders in this space. Um, and many tribes are working very collaboratively with their local and state governments. They're looking at whether or not traditional ecological knowledge can be incorporated into this climate change adaptation plan. And they're also centering resiliency. So this is something that we have not yet done in federal law, although it's certainly possible. The Biden administration has been talking about incorporating traditional ecological knowledge and centering resiliency, but it hasn't happened yet. 
So this is something that tribes are doing, and uh, certainly if the federal government's going to look a little closer at it, um, we should be looking at the tribal example and tribes to really lead in this space of how to be effective um, at local climate change adaptation. So with that, I'll say Che Miigwech, thank you very much, and I will turn it back to Angelo. Thanks so much. Great. <clears throat> thank you so much, um, uh, Elizabeth. That's a fantastic presentation, and I really love how you uh, were able to break that down at the beginning for a lot of folks who may be still kind of getting used to um, what is what. And as we know, very complicated uh, law as it relates to uh, tribal nations and Indian communities. So I just wanted to um, uh, you know, thank you so much for that presentation. And um, we're going to move now to uh, Dr. Clint Carroll. And uh, Clint Carroll is the Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. He received his doctorate from the University of California, Berkeley in Environmental Science, Policy and Management and his bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona in Anthropology with a minor in American Indian Studies. A citizen of the Cherokee Nation, he works closely with Cherokee people in Oklahoma on issues of land conservation and the perpetuation of land-based knowledge and ways of life. His book, Roots of Our Renewal, Ethnobotany and Cherokee Environmental Governance, explores how tribal natural resource managers navigate the material and structural conditions of settler colonialism as well as how recent efforts in cultural revitalization are informing such practices through traditional forms of decision-making and local environmental knowledge. Dr. Carroll has received fellowships from the Ford Foundation, Udall Foundation, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and National Science Foundation. He was also 2014-2016 Fellow of the Native Investigator Development Program funded by the National Institutes of Health. His work has been published in Ethnohistory, Geoforum, Environmental Research, EcoHealth, and two edited collections. He is an active member of the Native American Indigenous Studies Association and the Society for Applied Anthropology. So a uh, great book by Dr. Carroll, and I respect his work highly. I think he had a lot of fantastic uh, underpinnings here um, that we were also utilizing for Bears Ears. So just um, thinking, uh, Dr. Carol in advance for being here and just wonderful to have him here on our list of panelists. So turning the time over to you, Dr. Carol. Wado, Angelo, thank you so much. Oseo ni gado wo ukahati sikwani o hada wado. Gali e li ga ji de do ako hi ga. Gali e li ji je do ako hi ko hi ga. Um, thank you, uh, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy we are all here. Uh, I just want to extend uh, uh, thanks to, to Angelo Baca um, for moderating and, and for the introduction. I also want to thank uh, the leadership of the Italian Academy um, and staff and our wonderful tech support um, uh, for, for all that they've done to set this up. So I'm just grateful to be in this space with uh, some really amazing panelists and uh, folks who I consider uh, colleagues and friends. Um, I'm coming to you today from uh, Longmont, Colorado. I, I teach at, at uh, University of Colorado at Boulder, live just a few miles down the road. Um, this is all the ancestral territories um, of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. Um, and so with that, we'll go ahead and, and get my slides up and running. So while I pull up this clicker, there we go. Um, I'll just say a few words uh, just to kind of introduce uh, how I approach this work. Uh, my work entails building futures from what indigenous scholars Larry Gross and Kacho Risling Baldi have articulated as already lived apocalypses. The ending of worlds that has resulted in what Potawatomi scholar Kyle White calls our ancestors dystopia. My phone keeps going to sleep. Here we go. And so in indigenous studies uh, and kind of thinking about what we have often or have recently referred to uh, a lot as the Anthropocene, uh, we, we come to this term in a very critical way. 
Um, and so as you all know by now, uh, the Anthropocene is one way to describe our current global geological era marked by the extensive and long-term impacts of detrimental human activities on the vital systems of the planet. And yet there's a paradox to really highlight here when we talk about indigenous peoples, communities of color, and uh, low-income communities who face the most risks from the effects of climate change, even while these populations are often the least responsible for setting this change in motion. So I'd like to sit with this quote here, and I, I mentioned it just briefly uh, a few seconds ago from Kyle White, um, and I will go ahead and just read the whole thing in its entirety. Um, he writes, the environmental impacts of settler colonialism mean that quite a few indigenous peoples in North America are no longer able to relate locally to many of the plants and animals that are significant to them. In the Anthropocene then, some indigenous peoples already inhabit what our ancestors would have likely characterized as dystopian as a dystopian future. So we consider the future from what we believe is already a dystopia. So as indigenous peoples, we embody an optimism from this perspective of having inhabited post-apocalyptic dystopia since the dawn of colonialism. For indigenous peoples, the colonial scene rather than the Anthropocene more accurately describes our experience with human-induced change on a geological scale. Considering the impacts that these policies, practices, and mindsets have had on our peoples and the land. So my work proceeds from this standpoint. I approach climate action from the locally and tribally specific acts of regenerating and perpetuating land-based knowledge, practices, and relationships, as well as our language, which allows us to frame all of the above within a Cherokee understanding of the world. So I'd like to also sit with this quote by Dan Wildcat, who's a Yuchi um, member of the Muskogee Creek Nation, uh, and really just get into how he has reacted to climate change. He writes, I get angry when I think about global warming. I get angry because I know the history of involuntary removals and relocations indigenous peoples throughout the United States and around the world have endured. So when I began hearing the reports of indigenous displacement, as a result of climate change, I got angry. I thought, here we go again, another removal of indigenous peoples. So I wanna talk about this quote in relation to Cherokee people specifically um, in Oklahoma, in what is now called Oklahoma. And I wanna go through these four removals that Wildcat talks about in relation to Cherokee history and ongoing experience. So as we read with Wildcat, and as many of you may already know, uh, Cherokee people in what is now called Oklahoma and the Cherokee reservation in the northeastern part of that current state or that contemporary state, uh, that's not our homelands. We were removed, the majority of Cherokee people were removed along uh, the Trail of Tears, the trail where we cried um, from our southeastern homelands and uh, that makes up, as you can see in this map, the states of, of Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. And so this really just exhibits the core settlement areas in the Blue Ridge Mountains, as well as the, the extent of our homelands in this vast territory. Uh, what I want to highlight here, as the slide says, are the eco-regions and how um, they're somewhat similar, but also very different. I want to talk about that change as a result of displacement uh, and dispossession regarding um, how we're uh, inhabiting this current moment of climate action. And so you'll notice the Blue Ridge area, the Blue Ridge Mountains toward the east in the core settlement area. And then if you look toward the west, our current lands highlighted by that polygon there, uh, we inhabit the westernmost extent of the Ozark Highlands, um, and then it straddles the central irregular plains, okay? So here, an image of the landscape of our uh, original homelands in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Thinking about um, 
the biodiversity of this area that although it's threatened, it's still significant. So quoting here from Alfie Vick's work, the Southern Appalachian Mountains are considered one of the most botanically diverse temperate ecoregions in the world. These mountains were formed roughly 425 million years ago and have remained relatively stable over the last 200 million years, allowing for the evolution of tremendous biodiversity, including over 130 species of trees, 1,500 species of flowering plants, and over 4,000 species of other plants. We contrast and compare that with the western extent of the Ozark Mountains, and this is a picture that I took of uh, within our, our uh, reservation boundaries in Oklahoma. And we see some similarities here in terms of the rolling hills. Uh, we can also talk about the biodiversity being somewhat similar in terms of how it's supported by an oak and hickory forest. Uh, but you also notice that it's much less dramatic than the homelands. Here, just a geographical representation and, and topographical representation of where I'm talking about. And then more specifically with the orange dotted line, um, the area in which many of our traditional and rural communities uh, relocated to and continue to reside after the Trail of Tears up into the present. And these are the communities who I primarily engage with, and it's where a lot of our traditions, language, uh, uh, ceremonies are lived and grounded. So returning to Vic's work, uh, he writes, of the, the 739 plants that are documented to have been used by Ch the Cherokee Indians prior to removal, 230 of them are not native to Oklahoma. So 31.1% of the plant species that were utilized for medicine, food, fiber, dye, and other uses were not found growing naturally in the new landscape that awaited the Cherokees at the terminus of the Trail of Tears. So this highlights one aspect of loss via dispossession, okay? So the first removal. We look here at a uh, diagram of, at a map of current Cherokee Nation lands, and you should be familiar now with that polygon of our reservation boundary. But what this represents within that gray, um, dark gray line, uh, the, the, the black dots and kind of scattered checkerboard as we call them, uh, represent the current extent of tribal uh, trust land holdings. And so this was a result of the Allotment Act spanning from 1887 to 1934. And so we saw our land holdings go over this amount of time from 4.42 million acres to about 100,000 acres. And that includes individual trust lands as well and resulting in 98% land loss. So, Wildcat identifies allotment as the second removal for many indigenous nations. Okay, the removal of lands really right out from under uh, our feet. Um, he identifies the assimilation policy, which went in hand in hand, in tandem with allotment uh, as the third removal. And so that entailed the boarding school system. Um, taking, as, as uh, Elizabeth mentioned previously, taking children from their families and their communities um, and attempting to assimilate them in Western schooling. We could also talk about the 1907 creation of the state of Oklahoma and the resulting impacts, negative impacts that had on tribal sovereignty within that state, including uh, the Cherokee Nation and many other tribes, as well as the criminalization of indigenous religions throughout that time period and really spanning up until uh, 1978, technically, uh, with the American Indian Freedom of Religion Act. And so all of these aspects, and of course, the fourth removal is climate change. And the way that uh, Wildcat writes about it is that um, it compounds all of the uh, first three removals that indigenous peoples, many indigenous peoples have endured throughout history, throughout colonialism. In the Cherokee Nation, what we see is that climate change is threatening our very ability to relate to these culturally specific plants, culturally significant plants, that exist in that westernmost extent of the Ozark Mountains uh, because of shifts in, uh, in the climate and the fact that rising temperatures are threatening those plants within their current um, spot on the planet. And so the way that I've heard this described by a friend of mine and someone who I work closely with in the Secretary of Natural Resources office is that we're experiencing yet another removal 
but Cherokee people this time are staying put. We're physically not moving anywhere, but the climate is moving, um, uh, uh, moving our plants away from us or, or causing them to be threatened or vanish uh, because of the harsh conditions that they can endure. And yet, despite all of this loss, Cherokee people didn't stop being Cherokee, and we still haven't stopped being Cherokee. Our relationality to the land has persisted and continues to persist. So I've been thinking about this lately in terms of what I'm calling relational continuity, and that's signaled in the title of my talk today. Uh, in other words, the persistence of ethically and culturally grounded relationships with the land and non-humans, despite social and spatial change. Cherokees maintain relationality with the land by continuing the practices associated with our environmental knowledge. In our work together, numerous elders stress to me that if the people do not use the plants that have been given to Cherokees by the Creator, they will disappear. This philosophy assumes that proper, respectful use of plants for medicine, food, and crafts contributes to the well-being of plant communities and also conveys that with respectful use comes the practice of beneficial stewardship responsibilities. It also demonstrates the mutuality of being in relation with. For example, we might understand a plant, animal, or river to say, I will give to you and you can use me with this use, you will help me or others of my kind flourish. In this light, we might view indigenous adaptations through time as enacting technologies of relationality. Whereas technology typically connotes material innovations to overcome practical problems, often through the use of Western science, I propose that indigenous cultural technologies informed by ethical frameworks of relationality lead to innovations that decenter modernist and Western interpretations. Cherokees used technologies of rela relationality to make sense of the social and geographical changes that resulted from removal and therefore were able to maintain their place as Cherokees in relation to other beings and other lands. This relational continuity then informed key elements of life during the decades that followed removal and up to the present day. Viewing indigenous agency through this lens invites us to approach persistence and innovation as a matter of cultural continuity, maintaining an indigenous outlook on the world in the face of drastic changes in circumstances and in place. Further, this approach pushes us to reconsider not only how we view the role of technology, but how we understand that which, con that which constitutes technology itself. Indeed, perhaps what our societies need today more than ever is an understanding of how cultural technologies can work to counteract dominant technocratic narratives of control, control over and management of the earth, and instead to reinforce our roles and responsibilities as kin. Indigenous resurgence projects offer a counter to our current moment and demonstrate the urgency of taking seriously indigenous knowledge systems and ethical frameworks today. In this light, rather than what we might fix with machines and inventions, the world could refocus on how as humans, we can maintain, or in many cases, reestablish our relationships to the other beings of the earth that position us as good relatives rather than adversaries. So back to this notion of the colonial scene, pushing back on the term, the Anthropocene that, that uh, attempts to create a blanket human, like a, a, a blanket anthro or the human as a universal notion. So climate change and colonialism, as I've hoped to illuminate, are two sides of the same coin. They both entail the past and present disruption of relationships between humans and the earth, and for indigenous peoples, reacting to the colonial scene is fundamentally about restoring, reclaiming, and protecting these relationships. And I mentioned indigenous resurgence earlier, and I want to kind of position my work in this broad area of scholarship and action um, by kind of naming a few forms that it can take. Well, we can talk about land-based activism and land reclamation. Uh, you might um, know about this in the context of the hashtag and the movement, Land Back, 
Also multi-level advocacy and policy work on regional and global scales. And here I point to our colleagues and, and relatives who are working in the legal arena. Um, uh, uh, Elizabeth just presented um, some amazing insights in that sphere as well. But also, and this is where I situate myself as a, as a community-based researcher and, and Indigenous Studies scholar, uh, land education and community-based revitalization projects. So with that, I want to close with a, a little information about what this work looks like. And I'm working with um, uh, funding from an NSF Career Award to train a cohort of Cherokee students in our traditional environmental knowledge uh, and Western science when appropriate. Um, I do this with the guidance of a body of elder knowledge keepers called the Cherokee Medicine Keepers, with whom I've worked for over a decade. Other key partners are the staff members of our Secretary of Natural Resources office, who provide their expertise on tribal natural resource management and land conservation issues and strategies. The students who we're working with uh, also assist in a community-based research project that is guided by Indigenous methodologies. We are working with three rural Cherokee communities to understand how Cherokee people are navigating fragmented and fractionated landscapes like the one that you saw on the previous map to access plants for traditional uses. We hope this work can facilitate adaptive community-based strategies for tribal land conservation and reacquisition. And so I wanna just highlight a couple of uh, what are to me profound quotes from our elders in the Medicine Keepers group. Uh, Croslin Smith says, we have to do something to honor the spirit of this land. And to me, that exemplifies uh, this notion of relational continuity, that we aren't the original peoples of this place, uh, but we have to honor that spirit of the land. Gary Van, another member of our Medicine Keepers group writes or says, we were always told you come from the land and everything you need comes from the land. It's your fault if you go hungry. And so this to me really illuminates the sense of connection uh, to the land. And as I express in my title, um, we are the land, the land is us. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a real practical way of getting at that. Like there he's expressing, and he went on to describe um, that, that as a kid, growing up in, the, in that part of the uh, uh, rural Cherokee nation, um, snacks and um, uh, things that you could use to, to heal yourself if you fell and scraped your knee out in the woods where they would engage and play all day throughout the day in the summers especially, um, were always available for you. You just had to know what to look for. Uh, this is a, uh, an image or a photo of uh, one of our curriculum development workshops. Uh, you note that it's not in a boardroom with fluorescent lights. It's outdoors, seated around a fire. This is Phyllis Edwards in the center, Bonnie Kirk on the right, um, talking about how they would um, uh, envision a curriculum uh, for the Cherokee Environmental Leadership Program that really pushed back against their experiences, their own experiences in boarding schools as kids. I'm going to um, uh, kind of skim through these, even though um, they're very rich principles. I want to uh, be sure to allow plenty of time for uh, Margaret and our conversation. Um, but these were the, the guiding principles that um, arose through those workshops that we had. The notion of we are all related. Um, learning by doing. Is the word for teach me, but in Cherokee it really means show me. Um, communalism and interdependence, if we work together, we'll get somewhere. And lastly, having a good time. So, Ali enjoyment. This is the place or a picture of, of uh, a, 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 a place within a larger 820, 830 acre tract of land where we practice these activities. Uh, and the elders are guiding um, five students, five Cherokee students and how to process in this example here, uh, hickory nuts in order to make um, a traditional dish called kanachi, so uh, traditional food ways, as well as traditional medicines. Um, here, Summer Wilkie in the center, uh, Gary Van off to the right showing um, her and Savannah Anderson and Ashley Dreadful Water, uh, a medicinal plant root. Um, here, seated around this fire, uh, we have Crosland Smith in the center um, with the camo um, uh, jacket, and he's talking about his recent book, 
that we published together that contains um, Cherokee teachings that the students were, were learning from him. Our junior member Cherokee Davis harvesting a medicine plant to transplant from one place to um, uh, our, our area where we practice these things. So we're actively engaged in transplanting culturally significant plants so that they might grow and be accessible uh, to the work that we're doing. And then um, I think I'll wrap up here. This is um, Crosland Smith giving an, a lesson on cultural symbology. Uh, he's a, a medicine keeper. He's also a spiritual leader and a, a, a practicing medicine person, a healer. And uh, here we had to take our meeting indoors because of uh, torrential downpour uh, during that time in Oklahoma. But we still um, always meet uh, in this spirit of learning and engaging with each other as Cherokee people um, from that, uh, that standpoint of how, how do we approach these uh, issues of, of climate change and of alienation from culture, language, and land through a Cherokee uh, perspective. And so with that, I, I will um, wrap up and um, turn it back over to Angelo. Thank you all for your time. Wado. Wado, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Plink. Uh, fantastic information and presentation. I think it's uh, enlightening to see how this uh, traditional knowledge and Western knowledge are both working together in very uh, complex ways and also uh, encouraging to have the youth also pick that up and take those teachings forward. So thanks for all that great work that you're doing. And uh, let's move to uh, introducing um, uh, Margaret Redsteer who is an, an assistant professor in the uh, social in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington, which is coincidentally also my alma mater. Um, a member of the Crow Nation, she studies the ways that climate change is fueling dust storms. Drawing on local knowledge, she has documented the impact of climate change on indigenous peoples in the Southwest and the Great Plains. Her interest in geology stems from her concern about water quality on native lands. She was coordinating with her for a national climate assessment report on the impact of climate change on indigenous tribes in the southwestern United States. So join me in welcoming uh, Margaret Redsteer and I will turn the door to you. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, and I am really looking forward to our panel discussion. And I just want to underscore how special the people are that have been presenting today. There aren't that many people who have been able to work, for, work between the different sciences and traditional knowledge. So you have been listening to and hearing from some very special people. There are a handful of others I can think of that would also be great um, to include in the discussion today. But I actually threw out my PowerPoint presentation and decided um, that as a real result of COP26 and what we've learned from all of the climate assessments going forward, that um, it might be more useful for me to reflect on um, how indigenous people are seen in the international stage, and then also think about all of the voices that are still not included in these conversations, because they of course are the most marginal and, and vulnerable among us. And so the, I will be speaking from my own experiences rather than talking about my science. And I want to express some opinions this evening that are reflections as a scientist who has been trying to raise the issue of climate change and marginalized populations, as well as my own individual history and how that has informed way, the way I see the work going forward. So the theme of this introductory talk, Will Our Voices Be Heard, is not accompanied by um, a PowerPoint. But I'm, I'm aiming at stressing here that there are systems in place that continue to quiet the voices of the marginalized, even while there's a growing recognition that we need to understand human vulnerabilities to climate impacts. 
focusing on the needs of the most marginalized in our community communities is key to surviving the climate crisis. And it, just as it has been important for addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, I think the COVID pandemic has really opened a lot of people's eyes to the inequities in this country. Um, but there's more that, that we can discuss. So my presentation today focuses on three theme, main themes. Scientists who are concerned about the climate crisis and, and those of us working on the climate crisis can learn from other justice movements, such as the Me Too movement, because they counter social systems that are part of institutional frameworks that, have, that favor those with more power. Secondly, while community partnerships and collaborations can strengthen dialogues and are very important, they can't substitute for building the adaptive capacity of indigenous people and institutions and others that have been underserved and unsupported by a country that must come to terms with the procedural, with the systems that are part of our colonial legacies. Meaningful consultation and procedural justice are required to address the needs of those who are most affected and most vulnerable. The absence of diversity in the sciences, number three, and the lack of attention paid to other systems of knowledge has resulted in a lack of awareness about climate change climate changes already underway, and you've heard about some of these issues today. This has happened in both scientific assessments as well as the broader community, this lack of awareness, and sort of a, I think, um, an awakening that people are realizing that things have already changed. And without welcoming diverse perspectives, and providing intentional efforts to focus on the true access of education in science and, inter and interdisciplinary research. Um, we can't include thinking about where these future scientists and scholars can be more fully supported by academia so that open dialogues can assess vulnerabilities truly and invite new approaches to addressing climate change. We have yet to acknowledge the long history of current institutions that by their very nature are, will resist change in order to seek stability, even if that stability includes failed policies. There are many ways that climate change dialogues similarly exist within this unjust framework. The laws are written to favor the corporate extractive industries that have power and are experienced in doing environmental harms to the lands of the marginalized. Tribal governments have not granted the sovereignty required to hold the powerful interests accountable or to offer alternative economic pathways for their people. But even when laws are in place, the resources required to assess the harms have since their inception been underfunded and undercut by a system that created them to serve as mechanisms to enable extractive policies and powerful interests. That extraction being either natural resources such as coal, oil, or minerals, or as pools of low-wage labor. The lack of funding and support for the functioning of tribal governments also leaves these systems unequipped to serve their people and address climate change. At the same time, the industries that destroy the ecosystems we rely on have had a financial hold on some indigenous groups, um, especially large land-based tribes, although that is luckily beginning to change. This is because of the short-term imperative of financial survival and the Indian Mineral Leasing Act that has shaped the policy that provides income to many large land-based reservations. This has left some people afraid to talk about climate change in their communities where jobs unrelated to mining revenues are scarce. And after I left my home in the Bighorn Mountains, I found my way to Northern Arizona where I married a member of the Navajo Nation. I lived and worked on the Navajo Nation for many years, first as a parent, then as a scientist. As a young mother of three children living in northeastern Arizona, I heard a lot of stories about the land and how it changed. And there were other experiences too. In the summertime, whether traveling from Talani Lake, Arizona to Flagstaff, or from Crow Agency, Montana to Billings, the relief from excessive heat one feels when leaving reservation boundaries is significant. And this is because the average annual temperature difference between these locations is about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. 
I've also witnessed a lot of change, both living there and later working there as a scientist during the persistent drought that has gripped the Navajo Nation for decades. And I've collected measurements of vegetation cover, physical changes to the landscape, and I analyze climate change, the climate data from both Navajo and Crow tribal lands. In many places on the reservation in Arizona, there's no running water or refrigeration for relief from heat that has become excessive in hot summer months. Water quality, whether in Bernie or Crow Agency, Montana, or Fort Defiance, Arizona, is poor enough to destroy plumbing fixtures. These experiences change the types of questions one might ask if they take up a career in science, as I was, was privileged to do. After obtaining a PhD in geochemistry, I was hired by the U.S. Geological Survey, and I began to work on and focus on tribal lands and people, especially after I was lucky enough to obtain the funds to do so. Since then, I have published papers that include how the location of reservation boundaries should be considered when examining the vulnerability of reservation populations to climate change. I've also included the accounts of tribal elders and their observations of the land in my work with Kel colleagues Clara Kelly and Harris Francis, um, as well as John Doyle and Mari Eggers. The reason for publishing elder observations was not intended as co-production, although I think many people see it that way today. It was rather to acknowledge these observations as valid and important, as a me too, if you will, for Native community members. Because just as institutions are needed to support women from harm and provide ways to gather evidence of that harm, there are areas of the Western United States where meteorological and stream flow records are required, but very sparse. The same decade that James Hansen testified in Congress about the threat from climate change, weather observation sites on native lands were decommissioned, leaving swaths of land without the temperature, rainfall, and snowfall data required to corroborate the changes occurring. In southern and eastern Montana, the Four Corners area of the Southwest, as, other, as well as other rural areas, this is still an issue, as well as the lack of internet access and real-time data needed for early warnings about extreme events such as dust storms, tornadoes, or floods. Additionally, people living on the Navajo Nation in particular have often been blamed for ecological conditions that result from land use policies these policies promoted the expectation that people could raise enough livestock to support them, even while warming temperatures increase the aridity of an already marginal climate where they live. The shame heaped on indigenous people in dry lands around the world, where lands have become increasingly arid, increasingly arid is internalized by the people who suffer as desertification takes hold. People stop believing the validity of their own observations unless they see the physical data, become aware of their own history, and share their observations with others like them. Once the shame is lifted, they begin to realize they should not be blaming one another for the conditions of their land when policies beyond their control lead to unsustainable practices. I wasn't able to publish the work with Navajo tribal elders until I departed from the U.S. Geological Survey, even though it had been scientifically peer-reviewed in 2011. It wasn't published until 2018. This is because it never received the direct approval necessary for a federal science scientist to release it. Since then, I've learned about other climate science research languishing and in the, in the internal review process required by federal scientists. So, this, so the several cases that I experienced were similar to others, although I don't know how many. In spite of the barriers, I was able to report about the Navajo Nation drought to the UN Global Summit on Disaster Risk Reduction in 2011. This was in part because colleagues and networks enabled and supported my participation. It cannot be understated how important people and networks are who support one another in these dialogues, and they should know that they make a difference. In conducting research and directing a research project at the USGS, I was privileged to focus my work in Native communities, and I did provide data on landscape change, drought impacts, and paleoclimate history that I'm still working on and will probably work on the rest of my life. The work with tribal elders and acknowledge of land, acknowledgement of land use issues um, have always been geared towards climate adaptation, 
But when I started my research, we called it land use planning. This is because during the Bush administration, federal science scientists could not publicly mention climate change. Nevertheless, Native student interns participated and built research connections to the community. It provided an opportunity for them to learn science and do research that was meaningful for them and their families. Some of these students completed masters, bachelor's and doctorate degrees and have science careers now. Unfortunately, this work was not funded after 2017, um, although I am finding new ways, pathways forward. Um, in 2017, a new administration reset federal priorities and I resigned from the USGS to take my current position at the University of Washington in Bothell, the home of the Coastal Salish people. In short, climate, the change um, to academia has been good. I was probably not a good example of what a USGS scientist was supposed to do because I've always looked at the world as a connected place and, inter and, and, and interdisciplinary and wanted to ask how the changes in the earth systems relate to the living conditions of places of, in places of concern. I hope that at some point federal scientists will be less constrained and, do, and that I, I hope that they will not feel they need to struggle against an institution they work within where much of the science should be geared towards the public safety of all. Looking back on the work I did as a federal scientist and the work I continue to do in communities, this research does generate a great deal of useful information, but it doesn't act as a replacement for the real change in capacity that is needed. Providing a mechanism for people to validate their own history of observations has helped spur community awareness, but communities need to have their own voice, ask their own questions, and have a way forward that allows them to address, uh, to address their own needs. If indigenous people are to fully participate in climate change responses, their institutions and communities need to be able to acquire the information they need on their own, have the capacity to maintain and keep physical data and have opportunities to learn and build capacity that continues beyond the length of a research project or a pilot project. The knowledge systems of indigenous people also have to be understood and appreciated as potentially significant in contributing to finding a way forward in an era of changing climatic conditions. And you've heard some good examples today. But many indigenous people are alarmed by scientific efforts to co-produce information by taking and using the knowledge that indigenous people still have and applying it out of context for land management of places indigenous people may no longer have access to themselves. Without understanding the history of extraction from indigenous peoples and lands, and without agreements over tribal data sovereignty, the ability to share crucial information for disaster planning and other adaption, ad adaptation and mitigation efforts may remain stuck. In 2013, as mentioned, I co-authored Unique Challenges Facing Southwestern Tribes with Kirk Bemis from ZUNI, Rebecca Sosi, who is a, also a great legal scholar, Carletta Chief, and Mahesh Gautam. It was published as a technical report to the National Climate Assessment. The research, the experience of leading this writing paper was stressful because of worries of what could be written when so much of what happens in indigenous communities doesn't provide a favorable, a favorable reflection on government policies. This paper was mainly focused on explaining that native nations are not all the same, but they share a similar history of socioeconomic and political margula, marginalization that leads to endangered cultural practices and climate change vulnerability. These findings echo what colleagues that are here today have written and also need to be, be repeated over and over until they are understood more broadly. However, one concern of our paper that hasn't been repeated enough and still isn't repeated very often is that there's very little data available to quantify the changes that are occurring or to establish baseline conditions for many indigenous communities and rural areas today in the Western US. Additional data are crucial for understanding impacts on large land-based reservations in rural America for resource monitoring and scientific studies. 
Downscaled climate models don't work when there's no fine scale data to base them on. Part of that concern also hinges on the fact that even after decades of trying to diversify the physical sciences, there are still not enough native people in the earth sciences to be included as a statistic. After becoming scientists with credentials, it's not clear where the careers of indigenous people will be able to contribute their perspectives in climate dialogues. But luckily, it is happening. Colleagues who have managed to make it through the doctoral program have struggles though. Sometimes their research and knowledge is sidelined in the review process, process by others who consider local knowledge to be similar to storytelling, art, or philosophy, rather than experiential knowledge obtained by years, if not generations of observation. There is a growth within the climate assessment efforts to include indigenous people, and I've had experience in contributing to the IPCC fifth assessment report. However, the data and the findings hinge upon how many peer-reviewed papers can be provided as evidence of a trend. Again, this leads to significant difficulty in documenting the pace of climate change in the most sensitive region. These areas are low-lying and tropical islands, high mountains, tropical forests, desert margins, and polar regions where today's indigenous people commonly reside. These are areas that have been experiencing climate change impacts for decades, if not a century. But there is little information from these areas that would help to inform the world about the rate and pace of change and how, how the complex interactions in Earth's natural systems have altered in a changing climate. Because attention hasn't been focused on vulnerable regions, the broader public and the scientific community as well have been unaware and caught off guard by the pace of change. The ultimate irony may be that indigenous people who have survived under less than ideal conditions and have significant adaptation capacity and have, if they are given the opportunity, could inform and could innovate. Indigenous connections to place and ecosystems has informed assessment. It has informed adaptation and stewardship, even while climate dialogues have been focused elsewhere. It's encouraging that the focus on indigenous people is happening, especially among younger climate activists and students that study environmental issues. One of the most uplifting experiences I have is in reading the work and hearing the thoughts of my students. Now that I am teaching climate change adaptation policy and natural disasters at the University of Washington in Bothell, I spend a lot of time thinking about systems of knowledge and different ways of living. I am heartened by discussions with students around the ways that policies are shaped and how people end up in harm's way. We will all need to imagine a more informed future and have the ability to shape and create change. To adapt to climate change, we will have to admit what our vulnerabilities are and where climate change impacts have been felt. If those vulnerabilities shed unfavorable light on current or past policies, we can address them but people need to be able to talk openly about them first. As Catherine Hayhoe often says, if you want to address climate change, start by talking about it. I am grateful to the movements that have given voices back to those who have been quiet and they inspire me. At this point, I hear my thoughts more strongly voiced in the youth movements and protesters on the streets, as well as the wonderful and committed students in my classes. Hopefully this might also be a time when we can share more, when more platforms like this and symposiums like this will be held and we can provide people with more opportunities to learn and encourage one another to talk about how we will respond to the climate crisis. Interdisciplinary perspectives are needed to counter the politicization of science. Divisions and conflicts result when people are not heard or when their economic choices are limited to work that is focused on the destruction of their own future. There is fear that science will only be a tool for the few rather than the many. The inclusion of a diversity of values and perspectives is needed to shape new policies so that our institutions will have what they need to transition to a climate changing world. And so with that, um, 
I would like to pass it back to our conveners. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Professor Red Steer. Uh, I think that was very innovative and helpful for us to get a greater context, especially uh, thinking globally about climate change impacting indigenous communities. And in particular, um, the lack of data that often accompanies uh, these really important scientific projects that are really um, uh, super important to the future uh, of the world. So thank you so much for presenting that material. I think that just leaves us time now to shift right into the round table, which I assume is going to be um, uh, around 40 minutes or so. So um, I'm interested in, uh, you know, some of the materials that was presented today and people's discussions, their thoughts, their idea, their uh, particular, um, you know, contemporary projects in which they um, so Let me just then uh, go all the way back to thing with, uh, with Darren Ranko and maybe I can uh, ask you a question or two to see if we might have something um, uh, of interest to discuss here. Uh, so I would really like to, you know, go back to some of the um, presentation material and ask a little bit more about the uh, community-based participatory research. Um, I know that that is often a very challenging and daunting task, so I wonder how that has been, you know, received by the community and Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the uh, challenges or the successes of that particular project. Yeah, no, I can talk a lot more about the design. It was a very unique uh, design. We always try to get better at um, how to do this work. Uh, and it's one of the things that we did at the beginning of the research was we brought um and, and this goes to what a number of the other folks uh, margaret referenced this right in her talk too that you know exchanges of information if they're not done in our territory with our people on our um terms um can, can really be extractive you know in the way that colonial based research has been so we what we did uh, the very first instance, and we recognize that the climate modeling and climate science itself exists inside and outside the community. And and I'd love to hear Clint talk about his work on this, because I, I think he's been doing similar things, which is to say, we wanted to, on the one hand, center indigenous knowledge um, and frames around climate science. But one of the first things that we did was, was to bring, we have a nice, we have a very excellent climate change institute at the university of maine but we brought as opposed to them just sort of having a discussion around a table we brought them into the each of the communities um, we did a little bit of a road show kind of uh, over a meal uh each time you know trying to get them to present sort of their baseline of like this is what the climate models are gonna are saying um into the future um and then we had a sharing kind of, uh, you know, these are the, you know, over lunch, the indigenous knowledge keepers would, would, would frame up. These are the th kinds of changes we're seeing already. Um, and it really centered around, um, you know, this, this, um, this knowledge of the particularities of our resources as indigenous people. So we had very, from the very beginning, and then we followed that up with, with more um, sort of engagements and focus groups based of, that that built into those priority settings, but at the very first instant was to, you know, recognize that Western and and again, um, um, this was touched on in a couple of the talks. You know, the Western knowledge is is critical uh, in terms of observation, some of the observational sort of details, but it, it is almost an. Um, um, and some climate scientists will say this it's like some of it is like you don't know the difference between the noise and the and what is important you know around this the and i think indigenous knowledge 
uh, systems uh, often great insight into separating out that noise from um, from what is sort of critically important, where relationships uh, within the ecosystems are sort of broken or about to break. Um, those those forms of knowledge um, really framing up the work, uh, so that that exchange we tried to design that exchange right from the beginning that you know there's climate science and modeling work in and outside of our community but it was going to always be on the tribal communities terms you know in actually our you know i mean sometimes it's still just a seminar room but it, if it's in our tribal council chambers versus you know a seminar room in the um the university sometimes that can be um a significant difference in framing and who shows up um you know when you have these community meetings i mean you guys all know this it's like it's not it's not like oh who's invited you know it's more like you get a, like half of the community there just for curiosity's sake you know just being like why are there all these climate scientists from the university of maine here you know like that kind of engagement and discussion is a really powerful framing of the very first instance of sort of the design sides of this uh framework and again we grew you know we draw great inspiration from all those you know you know many of the examples that you know, were talked about but you know really trying to root it in the community's sort of you know uh, one of the one of the things i say about you know some of these research methods is that it's it, you know, we can call it indigenous research methods, and we should because it, it, it embodies our epistemologies and ontologies. But on the other hand, some of it is more like common sense. Like if you want indigenous people engaged, like you just be like, go to them, go to their place, you know, go, you know, we we as indigenous people should be the ones setting the, the table of research questions, right? All of that is kind of obvious but it's just sort of research western science researchers tend to think of like they're the they're the seed of knowledge and so they get to ask the questions so this shift is kind of you know on the one hand obvious and subtle but kind of hard to to do so i'd say like we took great efforts to frame it up in the proper way i mean i'm sure it wasn't perfect. I know for a fact it wasn't perfect, um, but I think so at times, you know, really trying to center it um, in the community, even when Western science is is, is involved, um, really can shift the dynamics around who's asking the question and who and what kinds of knowledge mm -hmm. is um, possible in answering the question. Mm -hmm. Sure, and uh, and in many ways, that imperfection is a classic hallmark of good community-based participatory research <laughs> because i feel Absolutely. like we're really still making the road by walking it essentially with indigenous scholars within a system that wasn't really designed for us we're trying to adapt to the ways that we can make it useful for us um so i'm i'm interested in those challenges because i think that's where it starts right like we have good intention about the particular goals of research and what it can impact and how it could do that but I feel like each tribal nation and community has like specific challenges and obstacles to overcome. And so too often, I think we see in research that people don't highlight their failures. And off, they also sometimes neglect to highlight successes. And when you do CBPR, I think um, it's important to recognize those successes. Um, so I've been kind of interested in that question and especially as it relates to all of your work uh, I wonder, Clint, you know, do you highlight or think of anything in particular about some successes or failures with that particular uh, CBPR approach? Yeah, um, well, I didn't preface my talk um, with the fact that the pandemic has upended our work in a significant way and, and continues to do so. And so it's, um, it's hard to um, you know, think about that um, and the urgency that this work, in my mind, demands um, not only for our lands and 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 waters, but because we've lost so much already, and now we're um, we're facing the loss of uh, a vulnerable part of our community, um, elders and fluent language speakers, who, um, you know. It's it's a compounded impact, and so that that really troubles me. 
uh, every day, really. <laughs> uh, haven't been able to go back home for uh, two years, and uh, it, it's it's really just painful to 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 have that 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 work that we were doing pause uh, for obvious important reasons, um, but also for um, just thinking about um, you know what we could have been doing up to this point had we not been in this situation. So we were just getting our um, you know wheels moving wheels turning um to that point about indigenous research methodologies and community-based um participatory research um that was something that i had to very intentionally factor into the research design um you know which it, it in itself was based on you know long-standing relationships with the advisory board for the the research project who are the medicine keepers um but then bringing extending that out twofold one to um, a student cohort and two and i mentioned this only briefly um uh, but the three communities who we're working with uh to think about these research questions if you will um that should be discussed and and and, and uh, you know uh, debated and thought through with regard to each community's priorities and perspectives but the big kind of driving force was how are Cherokee people navigating um, fractionated landscapes in the midst of climate change, um, and so this these kind of com these intersections of political uh, and environmental um, issues that um, really kind of drove the the project to to ultimately result in what we were hoping, uh, and we still hope, uh, but what we are hoping to result in. Um, community-based local conservation areas that uh, include uh, a Cherokee way of understanding that word conservation. So, you know, to your point about navigating institutions, you know, we're navigating a, a language and a set of institutions that uh, is built upon, uh, literally in the United States, the, the dispossession of, of, of Indigenous peoples. So, namely the National Park Service and that notion of conservation wrapped up in that, uh, that agency. And so I can't really speak to um, successes in that regard, other than the fact that we were creating a successful um, uh, path to walk um, that was predicated on first, we, we establish relationships, then we start doing interviews and community-based mapping and surveys, et cetera. Um, and that's when we were just getting started. Um, uh, when the pandemic hit. Um, but again, I don't want to be a pessimist here. Um, I think that the students that have gone through the program um, are still with us, um, despite the fact that the program has lasted program has you know, a year and a half beyond no, a year and a half beyond. originally intended to. Um, and um, uh, that in, in itself is a success and that we're the work that we we're able to do through the land-based education program um, uh, has has resulted in some amazing effects, uh, uh, you know, knowledge perpetuation, language learning um, that I really value. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I totally feel you on those challenges. Uh, we've lost uh, a few uh, key traditional knowledge holders and elders as well um, uh, due to the pandemic and, and just naturally. And that's always hard because the uh, the relationships that you have, especially with those older folks, they uh, are really supportive of the efforts. They're always um, encouraging of young people and especially of um, educated folks who want to carry this work forward. And, um, you know, that's that's something I think is uh, difficult in this time where we haven't really been given that time to, to grieve or acknowledge them. Um, but, uh, I think it's important to note, you know, that this is um, super important for just having that based in the community, having those anchors there, just, um, you know, they're, they're your guideposts and they're your, uh, your uh, mentors. You know, I, I always say that the, my elders are, um, the, they're my committee. <laughs> they're the ones, they're my professors. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I just continue mm -hmm. to um, learn from them. And, uh, we could spend our whole lives with them and not know everything there is to know. Um, so yeah, thanks for, for sharing that, Clint. And I wonder, Margaret, also if this might, uh, you know, evoke some kind of uh, thoughts and commentary 
uh, with you working uh, with communities um, in the Southwest and beyond and just kind of what some of those challenges were like and how you tackled it. Yeah, the, the COVID problems are serious and they really have brought a lot of work to, to a halt. In fact, I was going to be working sort of in your neck of the woods just before the pandemic hit. Um, the Ute Mountain Ute and White Mountain, our White Mesa Ute communities are working on revising their climate change adaptation plan. And I was supposed to spend the summer there this year. <laughs> and at first it looked like that might happen and then it didn't happen. And I'm hoping it'll happen next year. Um, but also I've lost relatives and tribal elders and people that were community members that really played a big role in a lot of the work I've done. And that is really, I think it's going to take a while to come to terms with that. Um, because I agree with Clinton. I mean, it really is about relationships and community and working together to solve the needs of the community and focusing on that. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. Um, in particular, I think that in this moment, you know, we are sort of doing these pivots to still make ourselves and our work um, as relevant as possible with the limited personal interaction that we can have. Um, and we find that challenge here also with uh, technology and internet signal and uh, anybody's, <laughs> you know, hardware and software challenges that we have uh, around in, in, in and around our nations. So, um, yeah, I, I'm kind of um, thinking about all of those uh, tangible and intangible challenges. But, you know, by and large, the work that we're doing, I think, having to do with climate change and thinking about the future is very important work and so for us to think about all the types of possibilities of solutions and collaborations and, and thinking through um, what the future could look like um, is, do you guys have um, any kind of potential future strategies that you think are utilized um, that you've sort of found or explored or possibly uncovered during your work i'm kind of thinking in particular here with them about um, citing when talking about indigenous and climate change. Uh, I wonder um, how how helpful that's been, or if it's been well, or um, what has that been like trying to utilize that that work for your own. Yeah, um, I didn't quite hear ahead. you. Yeah, can you ask that again? Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to uh, to ask a little bit about, you know, finding different strategies that might help your climate change research work. And you brought up uh, the UNDRIP, right, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Mm -hmm. And uh, just wondering how useful that's been. Um, does it, you know, help leverage uh, your work a little bit more when you're talking about climate change in Native communities? Yeah, you know, I think um, for us, we were, we were trying to, you know, think about the zone of contact outside of, uh, in some ways, outside of that BIA grant, um, you know, that, that began the work and, and to be you know, I think it's it's kind of like this this um, the structures that kind of frame up this work all the time with grants and whatnot seem to always be written into the boxes that don't capture who we are and 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 the, the zones that we would want to engage. So I th I think we we're really self conscious to say you know if and early on this is quite clear that people wanted to mobilize confederacy thinking because it was a, a grant to impact us all too, but also um, these scale of problems um, require, you know, 
in different frameworks, you know, that, that, that um, are meaningful to us. So for us, the undrip was just a kind of, you know, a space, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's had any legal or political impact per se, but it was a space to um, engage with potential partners to recognize that, you know, there is this larger than state or federal kind of framework out there um, mm -hmm. for us to be recognized through and express ourselves uh, and our goals uh, as as Wabanaki people in terms of our, our climate and, and how we adapt to it. And, and that kind of was liberating uh, to us and I think uh, provides a, a powerful potential form of communication you know, the stuff that went on in Glasgow the last two weeks isn't particularly help hopeful um, <laughs> from a rights standpoint. Um, but maybe, you know, some advances, you know, forest based indigenous people that that's a that's a step in the right direction. Um, if I'm trying to be optimistic, you know, there's both resources and recognitions there. Um, but I think it's 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 up to us to press this, you know. And, and I think um, the 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 obvious uh, global leadership uh, around climate justice um, is is uh, indigenous people, uh, and so our networks and frames around that, uh, and how we mobilize that as a as but not not just as a you know not just because it's the a UN framework, but it's it's precisely how we uh for you know in our case wabanaki people how we think of an international space of engagement and action right that's that's what will play out for us and i think we think of that as regional you know what would otherwise be called regional or <laughs> is that we have we are tasked right through our teachings um, to the bees, the stewards of this place, Wabanaki, you know, the larger Wabanaki territory. So we mobilize that as a guide for everyone um, to make our climate stewardship actions um, a foothold for all mm. action. So I think, you know, I think that's sort of the epistemological, ontological expressions around it, but it's very it's it's kind of like all we could come up with. I don't know if that's all we could come up with, but I mean, it was the only thing that made sense for us coming together because that's those are our those are our tools. That's what we've been given to work. kind of work. So I think it's really uh, I don't know if that helps any, but I think it's always in translation. I mean, that someone had mentioned that. I mean, the language is always, you know. Um, you know, a, a, a catch up or a translation, but I think there's even with that, there are ways that we shape it um, around our roles and responsibilities and our teachings. So I think that's how it go. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, you make what is, um, you know, what's useful to you and makes the most sense uh, for your communities that, that you guys are, are focusing on the work in. Um, I know here with uh, Bears Ears, we were taking that particular tact with uh, utilizing the Antiquities Act to leverage for uh, uh, protecting uh, cultural and, and scientific heritage. Um, but really, it's the first time Native folks brought that to the table for our use instead of having it imposed upon us. Uh, so I often think that there are a lot of creative and innovative ways um, to leverage certain kinds of mechanisms or existing tools. Um, and, you know, we may not, it, it may not be uh, applicable across the board for everyone, but sometimes uh, some things make more sense than others. And, uh, you know, I'm sort of uh, I'm thinking about, um, uh, in particular, some of um, uh, Clint's early work too, regarding, um, you know, working with uh, uh, agencies and, uh, you know, parks and uh, you know, navigating that particular institutional system that's sort of outside of uh, indigenous uh, epistemological um, ideas and concepts. 
Um, so what what is that like, um, uh, Clint, when you're navigating some of that um, and utilizing some other things that you know are helping to advance the goal of protecting these lands for your peoples? Yeah, I think you know this is the the question that constantly vexes me, and I think many of us, and in fact, a lot of the the work that I um, that you're ref referring to, I, I drew inspiration from from Darren's uh, previous work and, and articles. And so I want to credit that as well, because it was a part of my own kind of understanding of that exact question. And I think we can apply it to Margaret's uh, comment earlier about the academy, you know, the university and, and training uh, indigenous scientists within that framework. Um, and, you know, I'll just say that it's it, it, it goes back to uh, in strategic engagement. Um, uh, for me, at least, and you know, I just bashed the National Park Service in my previous comment, but at the same time, we're working with them as uh, as a, uh, a part of the national, uh, the federal rule that was published, I think, in 2016-ish, um, which allows for uh, tribes to establish gathering agreements within the national parks um, uh, through a you know process of consultation and and and, and partnership. Um, and so that technically has um, has happened between Cherokee Nation and you know using the um, the guidance and and wisdom and knowledge of our medicine keepers to work with Buffalo National River in northern Arkansas. And again, it just kind of it it it, it puts a lot of it throws a lot of complexity into the the situation because those also aren't our original homelands. If you want to you know go that route and say. Um, you know, uh, but I also think there's a, a damage in, uh, or, or a, a danger in kind of um, unnecessarily kind of rooting um, uh, the exact boundaries to where you're indigenous uh, versus where Cherokee people have kind of traveled and, you know, uh, related to different lands even before dispossession removal. Um, so uh, without getting off into an entirely different tangent, um, we have established a, gra a gathering agreement with Buffalo National River. Um, which acts, and I think it answers, or it gets at an answer to your previous question about um, futurities and thinking about uh, future possibilities in a, in a way that uh, plans for um, um, the worst, but also um, envisions what could be um, a, a scenario in which Cherokee people can perpetuate those relationships and that knowledge and those practices to plants that are um, that lie further east you know for for if we see um, you know annual temperature rises you know encroaching upon those oak and hickory forests in the ozarks you know how can we go and and establish and and, and work within that system um, and then influence as, as well because um, there is a, a certain amount of um, um, you know, I would say caretaking um, leverage that we have in working with the park system, or working with Buffalo National River, National River specifically, to influence how they manage those park lands. And so, you know, I, I'm kind of ambivalent when it comes to thinking about national parks as both kind of an example of, well, if you look at the lands that surround Buffalo National River, um, in contrast, those within the park are actually, you know, far more quote unquote healthy than surrounding you know farmland agricultural land um that hasn't you know been impacted by um you know uh, again fragmentation but also pesticide use etc cetera, etc cetera. um but then like doesn't mean that the national park service gets off scot-free because what about the <laughs> decades centuries of uh, suppression of indigenous practices within lands that were um, that go against park policy um, and that the dehumanization of those lands, the, the, the severance of those relationships as well. Um, so that kind of gets at that. And I'll just, I'll, I'll end uh, my comments on this note. It's also internal. And that's where I was kind of getting at uh, Darren's old work, or, you know, uh, past work. Um, we got to work this out at home too. You know, we got to work this out in our own governance structures. And I think that's like the platform at which we need to, to really start, uh, it, it keep working is if if we can model these um as darren says forms of diploma diplomacy and governance that um are in, in that include that fundamental relationship to the land um and can take that to the united nations and i'm not saying it hasn't been done i mean i think to the work of like Warren lyons and and those kind of really early activists from Haudenosaunee communities that were making this point a long time ago 
Um, but how can we do that if we haven't um, uh, accomplished that in some form within our own tribal governments? And I see good changes in Cherokee Nation, uh, but when I was doing my work as a as a PhD student and and even more recently, um, it was something that you know we when we think solely about economic uh, development, uh, what are we missing? Great, fantastic, um, uh, Margaret. I'm not sure if you would like to to weigh in here, but I, I know that you you brought up some fantastic points too, especially about the uh, science. Uh, you know, not being politicized, including you know, like really, that is about the future. That is about the work that we have to do at home and with everyone else. Um, I don't know if you if you'd care to comment. Well, uh, towards. Um... I guess in the the period of time that I worked for the federal government, the beginning was during the Bush administration. And then we couldn't really openly talk about climate change, but we could do a lot of work. And there was a really open relationship between my work and the Navajo Nation. And, it, and things went pretty well. Um, but by the end of the Obama administration, there was getting to be a lot more um, pushback against anything that might threaten uh, coal mining and the Navajo generating station and the jobs there. Um, and so things got more political over time, even though, <laughs> The initial part of my work was during a period of time when we couldn't even talk about climate change. And um, I'm not sure exactly why that dynamic played out the way it did. Um, but it's still a challenge to think about and remember what the perspective is of a tribal employee mm -hmm. versus a, a scientist who can come in and have so much more money and resources than they do and talk about problems that they know exist, but that they can't really have, don't really have the ad resources to address. Um, and so over time, I've gotten a lot more sensitive to those positions um, because I think it's important for us to remember that they're there um, and what frustrations result from that. Um, in fact, um, some of my work on the drought, which has led to a die off of vegetation and more mobile sand and dust. Um, I put together maps that showed where the area is more, we're going to be more prone to dust storms, sand and dust storms with, with climate change. And I took it to the water resources office of the Navajo Nation and got met with, what am I supposed to do about this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, give me something that I can work with. Give me some tools that help me understand the way forward. Um, tell me what to do to address problems. Don't give me more problems than I already need to address. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. important to remember what it must be like to be in that position. Because I think in academia, we're, um, we really are privileged um, to talk more freely about problems and to have the financial resources to work on. Yeah, that's a really good point, Margaret. I, I think that uh, we have the ability to kind of float in, in and out of multiple spaces, uh, whether that be governmental or NGOs, nonprofits, tribal councils, um, you know, various uh, collaborations are also very possible. Um, I don't know if anyone has, you know, been working significantly with uh, coalitions and sharing uh, information and work with other indigenous organizations or researchers, but, you know, sometimes we have found coalitions to be pretty useful. Um, so, you know, that's another possible route uh, for, for any future work. Um, I think we're, we're, 
going to be wrapping up here pretty soon, but you know, I'd really love to just check in with each one of you for a closing comment. Uh, maybe something we missed, something that's important uh, to add to this conversation, um, and possibly uh, something for uh, some some next steps. You know, I, I always say it's it's not enough for us to just research and know about this stuff. Now we got to do something about it. So, um, how about we uh, we go there and start with uh, with Darren. Yeah, thanks so much. I actually, I put in uh, our chat, I don't know who can see our chat, but, um, you know, just a few days ago, the Biden administration recognized the importance of indigenous ecological knowledge for federal decision making. Um, and it, it feels like, I mean, it was well worded, it was well thought out. And we probably three of us, four of us probably know some of the people who worked on that language. So, um, that that uh, that seems important uh, too. That that it's being framed in an in a, in a critical way, um, and it's supposed to influence not just decision making, but the the way science is done, especially as it impacts us. Uh, so I encourage people to look at that memo and, and the announcement of that memo. Um, that feels like an advance, and yet my experience is you know only one out of every five or six of those feelings like advance lead to um, a shift in in um, behavior or policy um, maybe i'm even being optimistic there um i do think that there is a thirst and and this is you know some of our work here uh, that is outside of the climate space is uh, related to land back and rematriation work um the the reestablishment of land relations uh and stewardship indigenous stewardship of places um and yet we have as many and there's very there's a lot of hope and a lot of potential partners uh, around that work and yet we still have courts in for us you know the first circuit saying twice in the last couple of years that our river is not our river as the Penobscot nation. Um, so um, severing, there's still takings, there's still territorial takings going on. At the same time, you have, uh, you know, the executive branch wanting <laughs> or recognizing our knowledge as an important part of it. So I, it, it's a, it's a complicated time and space, you know, for hope, um, I think we drill down on, and I, I'm old now, so I'm, you know, uh, I turned 50 a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, so I feel old, uh, I apologize. <laughs> but for for me, it is, you know, a re a re, uh, recommitment to the, the local kinds of supports and frameworks that have sustained us um, and that uh, provide a hopeful future um and i'm super mindful of that you know that our we're still here we're not supposed to be here uh, especially a tribe like mine that was like you know had bounties on our heads in seven the 1750s um so you know i think this form of resilience in our land-based uh responsibilities we take care of it it will take care of us these fundamentals um that highlight our need for work is really where I return to for hope. Uh, hopefully, others will <laughs> join in, um, both indigenous and non. Uh, but I think that's and I and I see this. Yeah, all the speakers tonight have that. You know, have that um, the heart and passion through this work. Um, so I think it's a really. It's um, to me that's the hope. Um, there's a lot to <laughs> to be critical of, but. I think that's what's mm -hmm. next is supporting that local rematriative land back work because that's where the, the core of our stewardship is and i know clint is actively involved in that work and i'm just i'm newer to it uh, i've been a more uh, pollution uh impacts on culture uh person for a lot of my career so yeah i'm, I'm hopeful around that work thank you uh, thanks, Darren, for uh, weighing in there and giving us a nice uh, closing comment. Like it is important to be hopeful. There's plenty to be uh, critical about for sure. Um, and I think 
more than ever, that's that's kind of you know uh, where we're at. We're at a very critical tipping point. But um, just it's good to have um, you know these great thoughts to end on because it's hard work. It's hard work and it's uphill, and we have a lot of work to do in our own communities and outside of them. Uh, so just really you know grateful for your participation today as well. Um, so maybe we could move right on to Clint there, see if um, you know you'd like to uh, give us a parting comment. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Angelo. And um, yeah, I guess before we all sign off, I just want to say how wonderful it is to be on this panel and how much I've uh, just really enjoyed um, meeting Margaret and Elizabeth and then reconnecting with uh, Darren and you, Angelo. So um, grateful, just grateful for all your work. Um, yeah, to your last point, Angelo, that's the, the big frustration with me, but I'm, I'm learning constantly from others who are talking about different ways of approaching the urgency and the, the notion of time um, with a, in a critical way that can really help for me, the, the fire um, that is just extremely, it's hard to ignore and, and thinking about how pressing um, these issues are and how fast we need to act with a different understanding of, you know, that seems to be the narrative of, of, of a lot of the climate science is, is this is urgent, this is, uh, we need to act now. Uh, and I'm not contesting that at all. In fact, I feel that sense of urgency, but also to your point, Angelo, about, um, the slow work that relationship building entails, the slow work that um, this type of uh, coalitional, whether it be coalitional or whether it be, um, you know, reestablishing and re regenerating uh, our knowledge and relationships to place and lands and language. Um, and I think that is important to kind of balance out that sense of urgency. Um, and I'm drawing from others who talk about this as well and who are inspiring me um, to think um, less, um, I guess pessimistically about where we're where we're at now and where we're headed, um, like um, uh, Mark Rifkin, Kyle White, thinking about uh, time and um, um, settler uh, time and what that means and how that constrains the way that we act uh, in re in response to the narratives and presentation of time as a uh, a singular conception or perception. And so, you know, I had that's where I have hope is that um, you know looking kind of back. Um, and thinking about where we've where we've come thus far, and then um, also um, aspirational um, uh, directions that we could go in regarding um, coalitional or or at least you know to to use Darren's framework of diplomacy. Um, that's one unexplored element of uh, the way that we could approach climate change and our, our reaction to it. Is you know I mentioned that climate shift. Um, was potentially threatening our, our ability to access plants that we rely on for food and medicine and crafts. Um, but what about learning from tribes further west um, and establishing those relationships uh, and, and creating knowledge sharing networks that, um, that really focus and highlight uh, on that sense of, um, well, you know, there, there, is, there is still life and there's still responsibilities that we have to life in our place. Um, how can we learn about different plants that may become more prevalent in the future that aren't uh, necessarily a part of our pharmacopoeia now? And I know that's sensitive because a lot of tribes are really closed with their knowledge and, and, and that's for good reason. But how can developing those relationships kind of be a, an example of um, uh, reenacting uh, a sense of diplomacy, but also uh, reestablishing political uh, relationships based on uh, indigenous to indigenous nation treaties and, and whatnot, which of course, you know, that we can see in the Pacific Rim, you know, um, uh, and the, uh, the the amazing work that's been going on there. I'm thinking of um, Alan Parker and Zoltan Grossman's book, um, Asserting Native Resilience, I think is what it's called. That really highlights those types of um, uh, treaties between indigenous nations, as opposed to solely centering the settler state and centering the, the federal government. Um, and then beyond that, thinking about uh, immediate actions that we can take that are drawing from really uh, incredible work in 
um, back to our conversation around, you know, uh, engaging strategically with dominant institutions, um, thinking of legal institutions like conservation easements and land trusts, um, and um, being able to gain access to lands in ways that support and enable cultural practices, even if it's not full, um, you know, reacquisition, um, you know, buying back land. Um, but now, you know, thinking about the, the amazing possibilities that this movement, this time that we find ourselves in now is presenting to where, you know, a lot of people have, have come up to me or my students, uh, well, virtually, of course, and said, you know, I have this tract of land and uh, in Northeast Oklahoma, you know, non-native person, um, how can we start this conversation about land back um, and, uh, you know, access to it for your activities that they were able to, to watch through our collaborative presentation, etc. So, so there are, there are glimmers of, of, of possibility and hope. I mean, there always are, um, um, despite the fact that, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Yes, thanks, Clint. I really appreciate that. Pretty uh, comprehensive there, <laughs> and in actually uh, really helpful things that you know we could expand on and have an entire conversation further on each one of those, uh, because I do believe that they are, um, you know, they're in motion right now as we speak in many parts of the country and many parts of, um, of tribal communities. So, uh, thank you for adding that to the to the conversation. Uh, Margaret, perhaps you would like to also contribute a, a parting comment for us tonight? Yeah, this is a tough act to follow. <laughs> but I will say when, some of the things that we should be thinking about, especially now that there's more recognition of traditional knowledge, is to think about what we can do with the consultation process because data sovereignty is important. And um, I think with the recognition that there is knowledge sharing to be had, it helps us to negotiate in those spaces more fully. Um, and I think it's important because this is not, it's not acceptable for it to be, you know, a one way street. And one of the ways that we can do that, as Clinton was just mentioning, uh, we should be talking to one another. There should be a lot of work across boundaries within different tribes. Um, and one of the frustrations I've, I'm facing um, at Ute Mountain is that they're not sharing a lot of information with me, but they're like asking me, well, you know a lot about Navajo grazing <laughs> over there in the Anath area. So we want you to work on this, but we're not going to share our information. We want you to share your information. And I'm like, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, you know, in order for us to work together, we have to be able to talk about um, cross boundary issues. Climate change crosses all boundaries, just like COVID does. And, and we have to be prepared to, to think that way. And if we join forces and become more unified in our voices, it, we have a lot more power. So I'll just end with that. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, and, I, and you know, something that I wanted to, to bring up with uh, Elizabeth Cronk Warner doing work here uh, in Utah, it's really hard also to get uh, women's voices involved. Um, it's such a very conservative and um, exclusionary um, environment um, for any women leadership or rematriation or any kind of uh, input in, in you know really uh, powerful spheres that exist uh, that is our lived reality so you know I'm, I'm really glad that you um, can share that with us and also just you know um, have the last word <laughs> as it were uh, and because <laughs> you know that's how we do it back home too so yeah, yeah. Um, you know I, I really appreciate um, each of you and your contributions and your wonderful thoughts and just the dedication and commitment that you have uh, to each of your your people your nations and of course uh, the rest of the world and as we like to say uh, back at Hopi we don't pray just for us we mm. pray for everyone yeah um, so yeah. Yeah. Really grateful. Um, uh, you, you guys stay safe, stay healthy, continue your work, uh, and go forward in a good way. So, yeah, cool, cool.
Oh. Don't stop. Um, <laughs> don't stop. We've only got the, the conversation barely going. I think got this discussion got better and better and this concluding section was the most gripping of all it points to the future it gives us some optimism um, uh, a degree of optimism which I haven't seen before for a very very long time I just want to thank you Angelo for your um, extraordinary moderation of this discussion it was completely brilliant you summarized everyone's points you brought out the wit and the wisdom of everybody who participated. So I can't thank you enough, Angelo. But I also, of course, want to thank our various speakers who left us with these marvelous parting shots. You have shown the way, all speakers today. And it is the indigenous populations in the US who have most respected the land, who have most understood the best, have most understood the relationship between earth and sky. And so I can't, animal and human, I, I think it's been a moving afternoon. I can't do enough. Please come back soon and may you all have a very good next few months and let us all navigate COVID as best we can and see each other once it's all over. Thank you so much. Goodbye and good night.